بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we praise our Lord and Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for granting us the tawfiq to be here today. A very important event. Mothers Behind the Stars. It's a unique title, a unique topic. And it really requires many hours. And I think we need more and more people coming to events talking about the pre pious predecessors of the Muslim women, the females. There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a very unique hadith. Before I mention the hadith to you, as far as the chain of transmission of this hadith is concerned, it's slightly questionable. The isnad is maybe, according to some scholars, not the chain, is not authentic enough. Other scholars have considered it to be authentic, including Shaykh al-Bari, rahimahullah. He considered it to be authentic, even though many others did not. It's a hadith related by Imam ibn Majah in his Sunan. The wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha, Ummul Mu'mineen, radiyallahu anha, she says, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, now this is like, we're, we're going to talk about the sisters, we're going to talk about women, but this is, hadith is addressed to men. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's in the Sunan of Imam ibn Majah, تَخَيَّرُوا لِنُطَفِكُمْ وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَكْفَاءُ the first part, تَخَيَّرُوا لِنُطَفِكُمْ O oh men, when you want to marry, when you are selecting a spouse, when you are choosing and searching for a wife, this is addressed to the men. And also, it can also be addressed to the women, because many of these texts of the Hadith and the Qur'an, Sometimes it's specifically addressed to a specific gender and it's exclusive for that gender. And sometimes, rather than lengthening the text, it's only addressed to one gender, but it can relate to both. The Messenger وسلم, said, when you are selecting, when you are in a process of selecting a suitable spouse, choose the most perfect spouse, تَخَيَّرُ be very careful, very selective who you choose as your spouse and where to cultivate your seed. The literal translation is تَخَيَّرُ Be very selective, be very careful where you cultivate your seed. You know what that means? The Messenger وسلم, is trying to tell us that look, when it's, when it's your time to marry, it's not just about you. It's not just about your own rights. It's not just about your compatibility. It's not just about you having a perfect wife. It's not just about you having a perfect husband. Think about your children. Your, you, your children have a right from now over you. You don't have a child in this world, but the first right, you know there are rights, hukuk, rights of the parents, rights of the children. The first right a child has over his parents is the fact that his father or mother chose a right life companion. That's the first right. Before anything, before your wife is even pregnant, before the wife is even pregnant, before you've even, you even have children, this is, once you, before you marry, 
This is the right of the children that you carefully select a woman who you think will be perfect to bring up your children. Select a suitable woman to be the mother of your children. Select a suitable man to be the father of your children. Just don't be selfish. Don't just think about your own selves and look what kind of man I want and what type of woman I want. I want someone to cook for me, that's it. And I want somebody to pamper me all day, husband to pamper me, a wife to cook for me. Just don't think about that. Just don't look at, you know, someone who's going to be good and beautiful and just looks and just be, don't be concerned about your own self. Rather, think ahead. It's unique. Think ahead. Select a perfect mother for your child. Select a perfect father for your child. This is the right of the child from now. These are the huquq, the haq of the children. This is a hadith in the Sunnah of Imam Ibn Majah. Because you see, the mother that comes, we're going to talk about mothers, right? And, and it's because here, I mean, this is general, right? Father selecting a suitable father, selecting a suitable mother, but because the, the whole event is about mothers behind the stars, so I'll focus more on the mother. Because a mother, and specifically the mother, especially in the beginning years of the child's life, has a very, very important role to play throughout the life, but especially in the beginning few years. The mother has a very important role to play. And we always hear, and this is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this, that be very careful, very choosy, very selective in choosing the most appropriate mother for your child. Your child deserves a mother that will bring it up into the world, that will educate that child, that daughter or son, instill in the heart of the child the iman and tawheed and reliance upon Allah. Educate the child, make the child healthy, make the child courageous. In inculcate and instill in the child the qualities of patience, of sabr, of love, of the akhirah, rather the love of this world. Giving preference to Allah and His Messenger and Deen over worldly pursuits and worldly benefits. You have to be very careful. And this, is, this starts from before you get married. That doesn't mean if you're already married and you've gone wrong, nobody's gone wrong, inshallah, you can still change. But it's, it starts from before. And that, that's why those sisters and brothers, if you're not married, think like that. That who do I want, as, not just as a husband, who do I want as a father of my child? Who will bring my children up in the most appropriate or the Islamic way? And you hear this statement all the time, behind every great, successful, you probably hear this all the time today in this event, successful, great man, there is a successful woman, mother, sister, daughter, wife. But I will say one thing here, that the opposite is also true, sister, sorry for being frank. Behind every evil man, more or less, not all the time, but it, behind a irreligious evil man, you, you will find that there is an effect. Not all the time, not all the time, some, it's not always the fault of the sisters, but in many cases, you know, we have to take both sides. If, if you give credit to the women and the mothers, you have to also mention the opposite, that many of the times if you find an irreligious person, someone who is very evil, then there is a non-upright, irreligious woman behind him, who is not helping and supporting him, making things difficult for him. And we also hear the famous statement that the mother is the lap, the, f the mother's lap, sorry, is the first institution, first madrasa of the child. Because the role of the mother, especially in the beginning few years, few months, the first year, second year, the, the mother has a key role to play. The mother has a key role to play in influencing the character, the upbringing of the child, how the gro child grows up to be in the world, in his life. The mother has a great say and a great and an important role to play. And we see all these people, you know, in our history, all these great Imams, more or less every one of them, who've excelled. The great Imams and the scholars and the Sahaba, and all of them, they were all young babies in the laps of their mothers. It started before the father can even think about doing something. It starts with the mother. And, and I'm not saying after birth, it starts even before birth. It starts from pregnancy. So you've chosen a, the husband, you choose the most appropriate mother, and then it starts even before pregnancy, really. It, I, if you see ideally, it starts before pregnancy. Um, that, this is the reason why scholars state that if a couple want to have children, they, need to so, they should sort their lives out anyway from beforehand. If they get married, sort their lives out. But if they still haven't become practicing, at least before you have children, 
change your ways, inculcate good qualities and habits in your life. And then when the woman gets pregnant, it starts from that time, how the woman is while she's pregnant. If she at home, when she's pregnant, it has a big impact on the children. The child in the stomach, in the womb, it has a big impact. It starts from pregnancy, making dua. A mother should, a, a woman, the moment she realizes that she's been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she should make dua. This is a sunnah, it's in the Quran. It's in the Quran about the mother of Maryam, alayha as-salatu wa afdalu taslim. She made a dua. It's in the Quran. She said, inni nadhartu ma fi batni muharranan fataqabbal minni. Oh Allah, I take a vow that whatever's in my stomach, I don't know if it's a son or a daughter, but she was thinking it's going to be a son. Ma fi batni muharranan, free for you exclusively. This son of mine in the previous nations and sharia and in the... In the Ummas of the previous prophets, they used to have this concept that mothers and parents, they would dedicate their, one of their children exclusively for the works of deen, for the sake of Allah and nothing else. So she made this nadar, she made a vow. Oh Allah, accept it from me, exclusively for you. But then she became disappointed when she found out that she gave birth to a, a daughter. She gave birth to a daughter. But when she did give birth to a daughter, she said, Inni sammaytuha Maryam. Oh Allah, I have... فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْ The Quran says, when she gave birth to a daughter, قَالَتْ She said, Inni wada'tuha untha. It's a, it's a female child. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنثَ وَإِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا مَرْيَمْ وَإِنِّي يُعِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَّتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ This is the part. She's making dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I ask you, she's a, she's a woman now, she's a, she's a girl, she's a daughter, she's not a son, I, I ask you, you protect her. And not just her, but you protect her offspring, her progeny, her children. And she was, the, she was Maryam alayha as-salatu wasalam, the mother of Isa, the dua of the grandmother of Isa, peace be upon him. Imagine making dua not for her, just her daughter, but even for her progeny. And, and then she became exclusively dedicated. She was worshipping Allah. Dua should be made from the moment you recognize and you realize, oh mother, that you're pregnant, you make dua. These are the supplications in the Quran. Oh Allah, make me someone who establishes prayer. And my children, women dhurriyati. This is a dua in the Quran. We should make a habit to make, uh, regularly recite this dua in prayer, even before salam, in prayer and after prayer. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun. Oh Allah, hablana, bless us. Min azwajina wa dhurriyatina. Bless us with, make our spouses and our children the coolness of our eyes. Hablana bin azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Make us as leaders of the righteous and pious and God-fearing, which means that make our children God-fearing. Making dua for children from a young age. From pregnancy, as I said. You know, women, mothers, even fathers, but as I said, and I don't want to repeat this, we're talking about mothers. Wake up in the middle of the night. Tahajjud salah. Offer two rakat tahajjud salah. Make dua once you're pregnant. And the, when a woman is pregnant, it's such a critical role. What she eats, what she thinks about, if she is going to spend her time in pregnancy, in increasing her ibadah, tilawah of the Qur'an, recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, excessive dhikr, remembrance of Allah, offering salah with khushu', with khudur, with devotion, with concentration, with humility and humbleness before Allah, making dua, that will have an impact. But if she's pregnant, and during pregnancy, she's watching Bollywood and Hollywood and Lollywood. And somebody told me today, uh, Dollywood in Bangladesh. I just found that today, by the way. Yeah, that child's going to become Salman Khan when he grows up. Yeah, it, it's true. If you're going to watch some soaps, then your child will become an East Ender actor. Or will want to be like that. If you're watching football uh, on the TV whilst the woman's pregnant, or she's breastfeeding and watching sports, your child will want to become David Beckham. And if you're watching Apprentice, he probably wants to be Alan Sugar or something. It's like that. What you think about if you're pregnant, reciting the book of Allah, pondering over the verses of the Quran, reading the seerah, your child will grow up to be like the Sahaba. It starts from that age, from pregnancy. Even before, but especially now at the time of pregnancy. It's a very important time 
Read the books. There are books written on the topic of motherhood, ideal mother, a very good book, things to do whilst a woman is pregnant. And re recite the book of Allah, increase ibadah, worshipping Allah, and definitely avoid sins. You know, backbiting, jealousy, hatred, all this especially, enmity, talking ill of others, especially at the time of pregnancy. If a, if a mother has these bad, evil habits, she picks up the phone, she's pregnant, she's breastfeeding, and two hours on the phone talking about the whole world except her own self, then the child will grow up to be a backbiter. He'll have enmity. The daughter will grow up, the son will grow up to be someone who's always bickering and fighting and arguing because it has a direct link attachment. There are, there are examples in history where the mother, how her lifestyle was, what she used to do while she was pregnant and while she was breastfeeding, had a direct impact. And this is even scientifically proven that the, the child in the stomach while the woman is pregnant, when he's being breastfed, in, in the child's brain works and his hearing, before the child even sees the hearing, has, the child has this quwa, this ability to hear. There are cases. Some things might be true, some might not be true, but they mention about Imam Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani rahimahullah that his, when, he, when he was born, he memorized many parts of the Quran. It's a, it's a story mentioned, I don't know the authenticity, how strong it is. But he, because his mother used to regularly was breastfeeding and pregnant beside the Book of Allah. But one story which is definitely authentic, which is very recent, one of the scholars of the subcontinent, Shaykh Zakaria al Kandahli rahimahullah, he says himself, he passed away in 1981, just very recent, that my father, and this was known, amongst the family members, the relatives, everybody knew that he said, my father, when, he's, when he was being weaned, which is two years of Islamic age, he actually memorized half of the juz, he already knew by heart half of or the quarter of first juz of the Quran. Reason being that every day whilst being breastfed, her mother had a habit, his mother had a habit of reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It starts from a young age. These are the responsibilities of the mother, right? So it's very important. Make dua for your children. Avoid sins, especially at the time of uh, pregnancy, at the time of breastfeeding. Do not breastfeed your children. And even think about evil things. Try to clear your mind. Read a book whilst you're breastfeeding. There's no, it's not haram or sinful. Don't read the book of Allah, but you know, read a book on seerah. Don't read a, some Islamic book whilst a woman is breastfeeding. It's very important, do not, do not, for the sake of Allah, ever watch anything on the TV whilst you are breastfeeding your mother. Because the consequences of that are very bad. And, and when, when the child grows up, this is a problem, when the child grows up, when the child leaves the path of Islam, we don't, we neglect the child when, we are, when the mother is pregnant. And when she's breastfeeding, she neglects the child. The parents, both of them, neglect the child when the child is one, two, three, four. We don't think about the Islamic tarbiyah. We, don't, we are not concerned about the Islamic upbringing. We are not concerned. We, we let them do whatever they want. And when they grow up, and when they're teenagers, when they're 18, and when they get into drugs and this and that, then we complain, what happened to our children? And then what happens? What do we do? Oh, you know, I don't know, my child has left the path of Islam, and he's run away with a girl, and run away with a boy, and this and that. Probably, I know someone's done black magic. You know what I say to these people? You've done black magic yourself. Seriously, you've done black magic yourself. Not literally speaking, but you have. Because you've neglected your child. And if you neglect your child, then it's very easy. Nowadays, everybody blames. I'm not saying for a moment it does not exist. But the easiest thing to blame in life is black magic. You can deflect the responsibility from yourself. It's easy. You know, you, want, you don't want to be known to be someone who's been... A, not, not a good parent, so you think black magic, so people won't say you're a bad parent. Oh, I'm a very good parent, but what can I do? I did the best in my life, but people are doing black magic, it's very easy. It's the easiest thing to blame. Every, you know, this is a big problem in the society. Everyone who has any problem, marital problem, black magic. Parents have left the path of Islam, black magic. To, to, to this uh, case that a sister recently, you know, once she, she was speaking to me, and she got so involved and absorbed by this whole idea of black magic that a spoon falls in the kitchen and she thinks someone's done black magic. You know, someone, anyone ill, black magic, come on. We get ill, we are human beings, this life is full of tests and trials. This is not Jannah, this is dunya. So anyway, it starts from that time. It starts from that time, from a young age. And we need to, at the time of breastfeeding, the mother needs to be very careful of ensuring that she worships Allah. She worships Allah, she does not, she does not uh, engage in sins, she avoids sins, especially ghibah and things like that. 
and she is focused on bringing up her child as a role model, as someone who will serve the deen of Allah, someone who will be a righteous, pious, religious, righteous individual, someone who will be good himself or herself and lead and direct others to good, who will serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, concern for the tarbiyah from a young age. We look at all these great imams, come on, all these big imams, when they when, except with a few exceptions, some of them were born before the mother, you know, they were, they were, the mothers passed away before they were born. But generally speaking, all of them, the young age, they were nourished, they were brought up, they were looked after, they were educated by their mothers. They should be concerned about the ta'aleem and tarbiyah. You know, you've heard of Imam Malik, Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, one of the great imams of this ummah. If you really know who Imam Malik was, then you'll appreciate this. Imam Malik is a huge figure. He, he is a huge Imam Udar al-Hijrah. He was known as the Imam of the abode of Hijrah. Malik ibn Anas, one of the great faqih of this ummah, one of the greatest scholars. If you want to list after the Sahaba and Tabi'un radiallahu anhu, the top 10 scholars ever in Islamic history, Imam Malik has to be in that list, maybe in the top five. Imam Malik is amazing. He's one of the unique scholars. If you read, just read his biography, Imam Malik. When he was young, he was a playful child. He used to like to chase pigeons. He used to chase pigeons and run around music singers, you know, singers and, and people, who musicians. And that's what he used to like. And, and his parents saw this. Once his father, even his father had a good, uh, you know, very influential role to play. Him, he, he, his father once made a comp competition between him and his brother. His brother won, he said, and then his father just smiled to tell him that, look, you're not really good for anything, which means that you're not, you know, you're not really taking your life seriously. And then he said, okay, you know what, I shouldn't run around pigeons, so what I'll do is I want to go and visit the singers and I want to become a musician. At that time, his mother said, look, son, you won't get anywhere in the world. This is Imam Malik's mother. You won't get anywhere in the world by running around singers and being a musician okay you won't get anywhere ta'allam al-ilm seek knowledge by the way there's nothing wrong being a nasheed singer um ta'allam al-ilm seek seek knowledge seek knowledge and then imam malik said and she, imam malik radiallahu anhu used to this is a famous statement of imam malik you'll find this in every book when i was young kadat ummi tu'ammimuni my mother used to place the turban on me. In some other riwayat, in some other uh, narrations it's mentioned, she made him wear the libas, the clothing, of, the clothing of the ulama and the righteous people and the pious people and the educated people and the scholars. She, when I was a young child, five, six, she used to place the turban on my head. And then she used to say to me on day one, فَتَقُولُلِي إِذْهَبْ إِلَى رَبِيْعَةَ Go, you need to go and study by the great alim of the time, whose name was Rabi'atul Rai, Rabi'a, male scholar, a great, huge Imam Malik's, one of Imam Malik's main teacher. Idhab ila Rabi'a, go to Rabi'a. And then she said, فَتَعَلَّمْ مِنْ أَدَبِهِ قَبْلَ أَن تَتَعَلَّمْ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ Learn from his adab, from his mannerism, from his etiquettes, from his character, from his attributes, before you start learning from his knowledge. This statement tells us so many things. Number one, his mother said, you need to study. Don't be a musician. She knows, she's interested. She wants to have a say in which career his, her child will take, the path that the child will take. And then just imagine, she knows the scholars of the time. She knows who the greatest scholar of the time is. Just telling him that, look, you need to go and study by Rabi'ah. Don't go by this Shaykh right now. You need to go and study by this Shaykh. This is her mother. And then she's telling her, him, instructing him about the tartib, the order, what to study first. Whether hadith or fiqh or tafsir or adab or akhlaq or what. This is her mother being directly involved, teaching and, and then educating the child. And we see this, you know, with, with everybody, uh, with Imam al-Shafi'i, you know Imam al-Shafi'i, another Imam, from the major four Imams, Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, Muhammad ibn Idris, a great Imam, he was born in Gaza, which we, what we call Gaza today, Gaza which is in Palestine, in Palestine, he was a young child, whilst 
His mother was pregnant, father passed away, single mother. A unique example of a single mother. It's amazing, read about these people. Unique example, she was young, she was very beautiful, but she, for the sake of her child, never married. That doesn't mean that you can't marry, it's actually sometimes wrong to think that a woman who's divorced or a widow not to marry, but she chose if somebody doesn't want to, she sacrificed another marriage for the sake of a child. And she saw that Imam Shafi'i was Muttalabi, Banu Muttalib. His lineage goes back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a Qurayshi, he was a Sayyid. Through lineage, she made hijrah for her child, a single mother. She was extremely poor, no wealth. The journey was very difficult, but still, she took a young son, moved from Gaza in Palestine, all the way to Mecca al mukarrama because scholars were there and she wanted her child to be a great scholar of Islam. And travel not by, you know what, what time is the train, take the train and you're there in about 10 hours or 5 hours. This is on the camel, on the foot. Imagine. This is Imam Shafi'i's mother, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she, despite being poor, she had no, no money to fund the education. But what happened? Allah blessed her. She relied on Allah, tawakkul on Allah. And the scholars down there, they saw that this single mother, young child, family of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, wa sallam, they taught him for free. And Imam Shafi'i became a huge, immense individual of this ummah, a faqih, a great jurist, somebody who was a master of the Arabic language. Read his books, he has a risala al-um, and then Imam Malik had al-muhatta of hadith. Imam Shafi'i, he, he became a poet as well. He was a, he was a huge uh, poet, a master of the Arabic language. Fasih al-lisan, kana baligh al-lisan. He was eloquent in his speech. And he actually studied with Imam Malik. He's a student of Imam Malik. And so this, you know, taking... Uh, uh, she was also very educated. She was a scholar herself, Imam Shafi's mother. She's actually got certain things that she spoke to the scholars of the time and she gave deliz and references and she, she, she became a scholar of the time. This is taking part, we talked about dua, we talked about pregnancy, influence on, on the child pregnancy. We talked about importance of taking an active interest in the education of the child. Even to the point that cooking food at the house has an important role and has an impact. Who cooks the food, how the cook, food is cooked, seriously, we don't think about this. Halal food, Allah says in the Quran, Kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba. Eat that which is lawful and pure, wholesome food. The one who cooks, not just halal, you know the one who cooks. If someone cooks the food, if your mother, if my mother, if our mothers, are, or our wives are cooking, or our daughters are cooking the food with it, you know, remembrance of Allah, the dhikr of Allah. If she's a hafidh of the Qur'an, she has memorized the Qur'an, imagine cooking, cooking food for the family and she's making khatams of the Qur'an. Imagine. You know how much barakah and nur will there be in that food? Unique food. You can never get that type of food. And there's another type of food. You go to a restaurant and you don't know who's cooked and how it's cooked and whether he's been swearing while he's cooking or what. Allah knows best. That's why, you know, try to avoid as much as possible food in restaurants, because it has a big impact. The food cooked by the person, individual, and there's stories, you know, there's incidents. If she's cooking the food and she's got a TV on Bollywood, that's it again, you eat that food and you'll become a Bollywood actor. If she's got a massive 32 inch HD, high definition, you know, game between Liverpool, Manchester United, and she's watching it, she's got interest in football, she's cooking food, oh yeah, goal, and she's, she's cooking away, or she's watching The Apprentice, or whatever, reality show, celeb celebrity, what is it, jungle, get me out of here, and all that business, then you'll probably end up in a jungle while after eating the food. You, you understand the point? It has an impact. There's a story, I don't have time to go into it, there's a story between Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, another great Imam. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was amazing as well, and there's stories about his mother, how he inculcated, how the mother inculcated adab in his life. But there's an incident about Imam Shafi'i was a teacher of Imam Ahmad. And there are different variations of who visited who, but then one of the versions of the story is that Imam Shafi'i, when he became old, Imam Ahmad, who was a student, became a huge scholar himself. Imam Shafi'i once sent a message that, look, now you've become a huge scholar. I haven't seen you for a long time. I haven't seen you for a long time. It would be nice to see you. So Imam Ahmad took time out, despite being extremely busy, 
I said, Shaykh, you know, inshallah, I know it's been a long time. You're my Shaykh, of course. I need to come and see you. I'll visit you. And then they fixed a the time. So he came to visit Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi actually left his village, went to the outskirts with all his students and companions to go and receive his amazing student who has become the great Shaykh of the time. Anyway, Imam Ahmed lived and stayed at Imam Shafi'i's house for a couple of days as a guest. His, Imam Shafi'i's daughter cooked the food. Okay? Anyway, cooked the food, he ate, after eating, what happened was, they gave him the room, this is where you sleep, and Imam Shafi'i at home had always been praising Imam Ahmed. I have a student, unique student, he's become the great Imam of the time, you will never, I am so proud of the student. He told his daughter about all of this. So anyway, after they went for Fajr Salah, he came back home, and his daughter said, Dad, you've been praising your great student, but I think... I, I don't really rate him. I, I, I think you've mista you're mistaken. He said, why? He said, I have three objections. Number one, he eats too much. I cook food. And I've never seen someone eat that much. Great people don't eat that much. Number two, I did his bed and I put some water there for him to wake up for Tahajjud Salah. I went in the morning when you guys went for Fajr in the masjid and the water still there. He, he didn't even pray Tahajjud Salah. And number three, he didn't even do wudu for Fajr. What kind of student do you th you're saying is a great Imam? So Imam Shafi'i, after Fajr, he said, I, I, you know, I trust you, but what's happened? Have you changed or what's happened? You know, my daughter's complaining. He said, look, number one, the food that I ate, I've, I have never felt the barakah and blessings of that food ever in my life, ever. It seems that someone who was cooking was reciting the book of Allah. There is so much nur in the food. And that's why I just ate, you know, I normally eat very less, but it was just the blessings of the food. And number two, because of the barakah, the blessings in the food, I did not sleep all night. I never needed to use the water. I never slept. All night, I did not pray the Salah because in my mind, about some say 20 or some say 30, rules and ahkam of Islam I derived from the Quran and Sunnah through the barakah of the food, they were just, just, just coming to my mind. And it was just an opening of the heart and the mind, the barakah of the food. And number three, I didn't do wudu because, uh, for Fajr because I prayed Fajr with the same wudu of Aisha. So Imam Shafi then said, then he told his daughter, this is the reason. And the food was cooked by the daughter. This daughter was the one who cooked the food, Imam Shafi's daughter. With a lot of, this, you see, it has an impact, impact on the child. So we need to, the mothers, the way they cook food, instill tawheed and yaqeen. I'm going to end inshallah, but you know, we need, mothers need to from a young age, tarbiyah. We talked about food, we're talking about education. Instill iman and yaqeen and tawheed in the children from a young age. A mother has to do tarbiyah of the child, even a father does. But a mother, like you have a five-year-old son who comes back from school, I want food. Not every day, but now and then. Say, son, you know, we ask, Allah gives us food, Allah gives us sustenance. Go to your room, make, go into the bathroom, remove your clothes first, get your, change your, into your good clothes. Make wudu, offer two rak'at, nafil pray and ask Allah, Allah will give you food and then come back. And then say, look, you pray two rak'at, Allah is giving you food. This is training, upbringing from a young, young age. It's very important. And a mother has an impact, you know, it has an impact on the child. You know the famous story of Sayyidina Umar, you know Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, I'll mention a couple of things and then I'll end. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, once whilst he was a Khalifa, he, he was doing the rounds. You know the story? And he overheard a daughter and the mother, remember? The daughter and the mother, and the mother said, daughter, you know, just add some water into the milk. He said, the Khalifa ibn Rumumin has banned it. He can't see us, the mother said. The daughter said, Ummi, ain Allah. Where is Allah then? Isn't Allah watching over us? So then Umar was outside hearing everything. He went away. Next day, he called for the daughter. And he was so affected and impressed by this daughter that he proposed for his son Asim. He went to his son Asim and he said, Look, this is an amazing, unique woman and you need to get married to her. And he did. And from their progeny was produced the like of Sayyidina Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu. This is, this is a woman making an impact. You know, there's another incident which is a unique incident. It's a hadith in the Muatta of Imam Malik and Sahih Mus, Muslim and elsewhere. Abu Talha and Umm Sulaim. Abu Talha is the husband, Umm Sulaim is the wife. They had a son who was extremely ill and sick. Right? And one day Abu Talha went to work. He left the house and he saw that. Came back home. Said to the wife, how's our son? Alhamdulillah, much more in peace. Better than before. I mean, unique woman. You know, these kind of women, qualities. Sometimes you think it's very rare to get these kind of women in this world. Inshallah, they will be. But just imagine, you know, sabr, patience, more patience than the man, you know, having 
sabr and patience and, and uh, the quality of ithar, of giving preference to others. She said, don't worry, he's very peaceful. And then she cooked, prepared food for the husband, made him eat, and then actually adorned herself. They actually had a sexual union that night. And then after they fulfilled their needs, they said to the Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha, said to Abu Talha, that, oh, my husband, can I ask you a question? He said, yes. If our neighbors borrow some oil or something from us, and if they want it back, is it wrong if we don't give it back? He said, of course it's wrong if we don't. If we, if we borrowed... If we borrowed something from our neighbor and they ask it and demand it and they, they want it back, of course we should give it. He said, likewise, Allah had blessed us with a son and Allah has taken the son back. So he got a shock. First he became upset, but he was gobsmacked. What kind of woman is she? Amazing, you know, just how, you know, how much thought she has put into this. Rather than, you know, just completely losing it. Sabr, patience. He went to, to the masjid of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered Salat al-Fajr and informed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What had happened? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was quite impressed and he made a dua and said, Barakallahu fi laylatikuma. May Allah bless your union last night. And the hadith states that from because of that dua and that sexual union of theirs, Allah produced great scholars of Islam and great qurras and recites of the Book of Allah from the union, from the progeny. They had immense amount of barakah. So, this is what a mother is, has a direct impact. You know, she, whatever habits, qualities, attributes a mother has through her pregnancy, through her breastfeeding, it gets transferred. If she's courageous, her courage is transferred to the child. So even Umar once was, came into the Medina, all the children saw him, saw him coming, they were scared. So they all fled. said, Umar is coming, Amir al-Mu'min is coming, everybody ran away. One child just stood. So Umar said, son, how comes you're not flee, uh, fleeing? Why don't you run away? He said, number one, I haven't committed any sin, so why should I flee? And number two, the, na- the road is not that narrow that you can't pass. You can pass. So he said, what's your name? Who, what's this guy's name? He said, Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He said, no wonder. You know, I'm not surprised. He is the son of Asma bint Abi Bakr. Asma was the daughter of Abu Bakr because she was very courageous. He's the son of Asma. Because she was very courageous, this guy, this kid is very courageous as well. These akhlaq, these habits, they get transferred into the child. If a mother is, has all these qualities of sabr, of patience, of, of, of courage, of, of preferring the akhirah over the dunya. And I will end, definitely end with this. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa one of the reasons that she, he was, he extremely loved his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha. I mean, he has mentioned many virtues of his wife. And one of, one of the main reasons was the end of her father. She preferred the, dun- the akhirah over the dunya, inshallah. We end with this, inshallah. We pray Allah grant us tawfiq, inshallah.